Hello everyone and welcome back to The Simple Skeptic. Please hit the subscribe button if you haven't done so already. Hit that little bell, you'll be notified every time a new video comes out. And uh, like or unlike, like would be preferred. Uh, this is my second look at Dr. Philip Stott. His second video. Um, buckle up, because you might fall out of your chair when you find out exactly where he goes. One of the oldest creationist arguments in a book, one that's been debunked a thousand times or more, and he goes there. Do you think there could be one sentence that could convince, um, let's say, a creationist to seriously doubt their theory? Ideally, if you could convince a believer in God to really doubt their belief, but that's too hard. Not sure about a, about a sentence. I think perhaps the single most convincing fact, the observation that you could point to would be the, um, the pattern of resemblances that you see when you compare the genes using modern DNA techniques, actually looking at the letter-to-letter -letter correspondences between genes. Compare the genes of any pair of animals you like, uh, pair of animals, pair of plants, and then plot out the resemblances and they fall in a perfect hierarchy, a perfect family tree. Well laid out response to the question. Let's see where Dr. Stott goes with it. Dawkins is right that in thinking that anyone who believes in evolution... We don't believe in evolution, Dr. Stott. This may seem like a minor nitpick, but I think it's relevant. We don't believe in evolution. We accept the scientific evidence for evolution. If you could come up with something better, we'll listen. But. I don't think many of us have seen anything better so far. Would find the sequence of nucleic acids in DNA compelling evidence for evolution. Compelling? It's just about ironclad. The problem is that a considerable number of acclaimed scientists... A considerable number. Do you want to give us a percentage? Because I can almost guarantee you that the number of acclaimed scientists who accept evolution is far greater. Probably in excess of 95, 96%. ...have examined the physics and chemistry of the theory and have come to the conclusion that evolution is simply impossible. Well, they're wrong. To quote Arthur C. Clarke's first law, when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. Chanda Wickramasinghe, for example, said, the impossibility of evolution is a fact of science which biologists seem blind to. Wickramasinghe is indeed a distinguished scientist. But just because he doesn't accept evolution, or prefers creationism, or thinks that evolution is impossible, it doesn't mean that he's right. The first and most basic disproof is the fact that it contradicts the most fundamental law in science. Stand by. Here we go. The second law of thermodynamics. Yeah, he went there. Something that's been debunked no end of times. And he should know it. In fact, he probably does know it. But like most creationists, he's disingenuous and he's willing to lie for Jesus. In easily understood language, this law states that any system left to follow natural processes becomes disordered. Yes, I think we're all acquainted with the second law of thermodynamics, entropy. And it applies to everything in the universe. But there's the key word, universe. Now, I'm going to give you a very, very crude analogy, but it's the best I can come up with at the moment. Have you ever stood beside a river, near a waterfall maybe, some swift running water? And even though most of the water in that river is running in one direction, you'll get little backwaters, little eddies, little bits that are actually going backwards, usually near the bank. Uh, that is where evolution occurs. Okay. Eventually, yes, the universe will just die out. The sun will die out. Earth will die. Life will die. 
But evolution is a rebel. Evolution takes place anyway and organizes things in defiance of entropy. How does it do this? Well, again, like most creationists, you are being disingenuous and you're only quoting a certain portion of the second law of thermodynamics. You have to state that the second law of thermodynamics only applies in a closed system. Yes, the universe as a whole is a closed system and eventually it will run down. But the Earth's biosphere, its ecosphere, where evolution takes place, is not a closed system. Anyone knows that. You know it. The Earth's biosphere receives a lot of energy from outside, principally solar energy from the sun, a secondary amount from uh, geothermal energy, the processes taking place within the Earth, and a small but not insignificant amount from radioactive decay. It is this energy that is coming into the system that evolution uses to build itself, to build plants, to build animals, to keep the evolutionary process going until one day when the sun decides to burn out and everything on earth is gone. Please, don't use this. Creationists have been using this for decades. It's been disproven for decades. It is old, it is stale, it is wrong, and you know it. Now, he goes on for quite a bit more trying to explain where he's coming from. We don't need to go into that. When his argument starts with such a flawed premise, one that is absolutely 100% wrong, we don't need to listen to him explain how wrong he is. We know it. He knows it. Let's just get out of here and have a beer. Now, as if to keep this going, let's have our regular look at stupid statements from creationists. And uh, have a nice day.